Right, thank you, and welcome back. Um, the session before the break was an introduction to Crossref and the organization, and then a, the general talk that I gave about quality of publishing, and then Kim about locks, clocks. Um, this, the session we have now before lunch, I'll be talking particularly about the DOI, the Crossref Digital Object Identifier, and then Roberta will give us case study for um, a VT, VGTU. Thank you, VGTU. And but we will have a question session just before lunch. So if any of you have any questions that from this morning please keep them and we'll have a session to talk about some issues before lunch. So this session I'm now going to be talking about DOIs, so which are digital object identifiers. Of the registrants that are here today, about half of you are a member of Crossref and use digital object identifiers, and about half of you do not or are unsure. So this presentation will cover what DOIs are, the problem of broken links, and how the Crossref DOI system works. Even if you are familiar with DOIs, I hope there will be information here that you'll find useful, and particular on how to manage and maintain your DOIs. So we're covering the problem of broken links, registering, displaying, maintaining the DOIs, which is a very important part of the whole process. And particularly of interest, I hope, to everybody here, not just the publishers and not just members, is how to add DOIs into references, which anybody can do. You don't need to be a member. And it enhances the value of your publications, particularly because it allows the readers who access the content online to then link from the references to the full text. So that's quite an important part here. And you'll be glad to know I'll be talking about how you can try to get your authors to do this so the publishers don't have to. So what is the problem? The problem is broken links online. And I'm sure everybody has come across problems with this. The reason we want links is that researchers want to be able to follow a train of information online, to read an article, to go to the reference list, and from that reference list to easily get to the articles that are in the reference list. This is part of the whole online research reading experience, which is becoming really important. So we need, as publishers, to include hypertext links within the references to enable readers to jump on. Now, we could include the URL. So that's the web address. Um, and that's fine. I, as far as it goes, that's absolutely fine. Because if the reader clicks on it, they go to the right page. And that's great. The problem comes when that page has been moved somewhere else, and in which case you get that, the error 404 not found. And some research recently on articles within Thomson Reuters, so the web of science, the web of social science, found that within, I think it was about nine years, almost one third of the scholarly references had error 404 on them. So this is not an ephemeral thing that happens outside scholarly publishing. Even in scholarly publishing, content moves. Now, as, as Kim talked about before, part of this is because publishers don't always archive content, and the publisher may go out of business. But a lot of it happens simply because the website is updated. It's changed. It's improved. And it means the URL of the individual articles changes. So if you go to URLs for articles on a publisher's site 
10 years ago and then today, the chances are that the URL will no longer work, even though the content is there somewhere. And if the publisher stops publishing, that's an even bigger problem. Um, so putting the URL in is helpful, but potentially in the future it's not going to work because content moves all the time. Um, common instances of this are where you publish a journal on your own university website and then you start publishing collaboratively with a publisher, perhaps Elsevier or Wiley or Taylor and Francis and the journal moves onto their website. That's perfectly reasonable, but of course, everyone that has previously linked to the article on your university website will now not find it. So this happens all the time. So the solution, and particularly with Crossref, is like a thumbprint, a unique digital object identifier that identifies the content now, this is not the URL, this is the content, this is the whole package. So it's the content itself and where you can find that content. So technically, what is a DOI? It stands for Digital Object Identifier. It's a unique number, like an ISBN for a book, that identifies the content. Now, this was not invented by Crossref. This is part, this is an international global standard for digital things, digital stuff. Um, so it's not just for scholarly content. You can get DOIs for online films, multimedia, images, etc. So it's, this is not Crossref and this is not just scholarly publishing. This is a big standard. So hopefully, it's never going to go away. Um, how it's organized is there is an international DOI foundation which manages centrally the whole system. And then you have um, individual organizations that are responsible for the technology behind it that link the system. And then you have the registration agencies of which Crossref is one of them. So there's only one DOI foundation. Um, the Corporation for National Research is the organization that handles the technology, which is called the handle system, to confuse it. But then you have multiple registration agencies. So this is a list of, I think, all of the agencies at the moment. There may be some others. And some of them deal with different types of content. Um, so, for example, the Publications Office of the European Union allocates DOIs specifically for content, particularly um, guidelines, policy documents, etc., that come out of the EU's Publication Office. And Crossref Cross deals with scholarly content, particularly. So, you could register an, your DOI with any of these agencies. Um, but there is good reason why you would choose Crossref. So I'm not sure in this area, does anybody have a DOI that's reg does anybody use perhaps the Publications Office of the European Union to register DOIs? Does anyone register DOIs with someone who is not Crossref? Right. This makes you much easier to talk to than China. Um, because in China there are two registration agencies and it gets very confusing. So thank you. Um, so lots of different registration agencies. Okay, now you might have seen a DOI in published somewhere. And this is what it will look like. It comprises three parts. The first part, the red bit, is the directory. That's the bit that makes this actionable as a URL. So dx.doi.org, and that's the location. You then have a prefix. The prefix indicates the person or company that deposits the DOI. So 10.1006 could be Wiley, 
or it could be Taylor and Francis, or it could be VGTU. So that's the parent company. And the suffix is the unique identifier for that piece of content. So this could be a journal article, or a book chapter, or maybe even a table within an article. So it identifies a piece of content. Um, the blue bit is assigned by Crossref. So when you become a member of Crossref, you are given a, a prefix that identifies you. But you as publishers um, assign your own suffixes. And then behind this, because remember I said a DOI is the whole package. It's not just a, a URL. So behind this URL, effectively, is what's called metadata. And metadata is the bibliographic details about an article or a book chapter or a table. So it's the name of it. For example, an article about Pippa Smart. So it's the title. It's the author, perhaps Ginny Hendrix as the author name. And then if it's in a journal, you've got the volume, the issue, the publication date, and there's a whole, there's a whole lot of this data. But effectively, this is the bibliographic data that describes the content. And then part of it, of course, is the URL on which this content appears. So that's the parcel behind the DOI. Now, <laughs> why do I keep saying Crossref DOI, which I have not been saying, but I should be saying Crossref DOI, is because each registration agency provides a, a selection of different services. And because Crossref deals particularly with the scholarly environment, Crossref provide a lot of services as to its members and to non-members, to anybody, which are very unique and specific to the scholarly environment, such as the plagiarism checker we'll talk about this afternoon, such as the system Crossmark, which helps in dealing with erratum and retractions, and um, such as Cited By, which is finding out who is citing and referring to your articles. So the Crossref DOI and being a member of Crossref provides access to different services. So how DOIs work, you become a member of Crossref and you get your prefix. So here your prefix is 10.1234. So you get your prefix. Then every time you publish an article or a book chapter, you assign it a unique number. So here, PDS001, PDS002, etc. So you assign a unique number. You then, for every article you've got, you submit the metadata, that bibliographic data, the DOI that you've assigned, and the URL on which that metadata, that content will appear to Crossref, and it gets added to the database. And then the Crossref DOI can be used to cite your article. Now the reader isn't aware of this. A reader seems a seamless link. They click on a link in a reference and it takes them straight to your content. So for them, it's a normal link. But what is actually happening is when they click on the link, it goes through the, sorry, when they click on the link, it goes through the Crossref database to your content. So every time somebody clicks on a link, it's going real time to find out where is that content online. And the reason this is important is that it means that if you move your content to a different website with a different URL, so long as you have updated your metadata, that link automatically redirects. So the publisher of this article, Quantitative Analysis, they do not have to update the URL in their reference because the DOI automatically takes them to a new page. And the reason this is better than a URL 
is that after you've published your content, hopefully there's going to be lots of other articles on the web which will link to your content because they'll reference you, they'll cite you. So all these other journals and blog sites and web pages will link to your article. But of course, if your article moves, they're linking to a blank page. But if they're linking to a DOI, then they're automatically redirected to your new page. So you, don't, you only have to tell Crossref if your DOI changes because automatically everything is updated. So this is an attempt to stop the broken link problem. Now, you might ask, how does the Crossref DOI know where to redirect? It only knows if you, as the publisher, tell it. And this is a really important thing. So when you deposit your metadata originally, it contains the URL. If the URL changes, you need to re-deposit that metadata again. So you need to tell Crossref that the URL has updated. So there is a responsibility for you if the URL changes, you must update that information. Really importantly, and I think we'll be saying this several times today, do not change the DOI. Never give the same article another DOI. One article, one DOI, always. Never assign a different DOI. Because once you assign a different DOI, then the people that are already linking to your old DOI will have exactly the same problem as if they directed to a URL. So really important. One article, one DOI. So how do you register them? Um, really importantly, anybody that's a member of Crossref, Crossref have a really good help page or pages. There's a lot of information there. So if you have any questions, go to the help page. Now the basic process for depositing your DOI and the metadata is that once you've created the suffix and you know the URL, you use XML as a format in which you capture the metadata that you then deposit with Crossref. Um, don't worry if you're not using XML, but um, many publishers now, when they typeset the content, they don't just typeset it in InDesign or something to make the page look good. They're actually capturing the content underneath by identifying this is the title, this is the author, this is the address, etc., in a format that is called XML. And Ideally, when you extract that XML data, you can use that to deposit for Crossref as well as for lots of different purposes. So the basic process is that you would use the XML that your typesetter or your printer has already created, and that would be used to extract the metadata for the Crossref deposit. And then it would be uploaded either for small publishers through the web interface for big publishers, they have pro automatic programs that update. So for example, Wiley, they have an automatic program that updates and resubmits its metadata, I think is it every, every two days? Because they're a very big publisher, so they have a program to do it automatically. For smaller publishers, you don't need that regularity. So you can do it using the web form when you require it. Once you have deposited that data, it automatically, through the Crossref magic robots, gets added into the Crossref data system. And then once it's there, people can use it to resolve, which means that the DOI will create a hyperlink to your content. And it's using this technology, the handle technology, which underlies all of the DOIs. So, the prefix, in a, the, the detail, a bit more detail about this. Ten point 
um, indicates that it's a cross-ref and it's scholarly content DOI. Not that it matters, but that's for a quiz question, should you have one. Now, importantly, the prefix does not identify the current owner. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is that if you publish your own journal and you are a member of Crossref, you will get a prefix. Uh, for example, 1006. If you then decide that you want to move all your content to be published by Wiley, then Wiley will start using their own prefix at the point at which you start working with them. And this means that one journal can have articles with different prefixes. It doesn't matter. The prefix only indicates the member at the time it was deposited. So it's like an ISBN um, that no one really looks at the bit after the 978. Is it 978? The first bit, um, which tells you who the publisher is. Um, zero, for example, is Penguin but nobody cares about that. And it's the same with this prefix. It, it can change if you look at a journal's archive, so it's not that important. The suffix is assigned by you, the publishers, and it must be unique, of course. You mustn't assign the same suffix to multiple articles. Every article must have a unique identifier. Um, it should be consistent, logical, easily documented. Um, it's also case insensitive. And in fact, this example here, um, it's probably, JMBI is probably the acronym of the journal. 1995 is probably the year of publication. And 0238 is probably the number of the article. Um, so this is sort of a human intelligible. Um, suffix, but they don't have to be. They can be any numbers. But it is highly recommended that they're kept as short as possible, simply because the longer you make something, the more likely it is that there could be an error in it when somebody uses it. So try to keep it small, and they don't have to be human intuitive. Personally, and this is not a cross-ref stand, personally I find them helpful when they are intuitive. But from a cross-ref perspective, and from anybody that's using the link, it's, that's not important. But try to keep them a bit short. You can see some of these are very long, um, whereas others of them are very short. Now, the basic bibliographic or metadata that you need underneath it is here on the left. So author, journal, title, etc. But you can add optional metadata. And this afternoon, we'll discuss why that would be used and why that might be beneficial. But it can include things like the references, um, the funding information behind the article, um, ORCID, which we'll talk about a bit later, which is the, a unique number system for authors, and maybe the abstracts. So there is some optional information you can deposit as well. Um, this is a snapshot of what XML looks like, should anybody want to see what XML looks like. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but you can see here the journal title. You've got the full title, which is the American Journal of Meetings, an abbreviation, the ISSN of the journal, etc. So it's that type of information, and it's in a tagged format that a machine can understand, because the machine needs to put it into the database. How it works, you upload your submission into the Crossref robot system, and you get a submission report. Sorry. So you get a submission report. It is really important to check your submission reports. Um, they don't all come in like this, but you need to check that there's no problems with what you've submitted. And the reason this is important is because there might be a problem with the XML file, and you need to pick it up, and make a correction. So when you get a submission report, please don't ignore them. However, for those of you and me that are uncomfortable with XML, um, or frankly think that life is too short to worry about XML and problems like this, 
There are solutions whereby you do not need to be working with XML to still be a member and still deposit your, um, your DOIs with Crossref. And it's, there is this web deposit form. Uh, the URLs here and in the handouts you've got, on the back page you'll find some useful URLs and this will be amongst them. Basically, this is an online form into which you cut and paste the bibliographic information and then when you hit the submit button, the form creates the XML for you. So you don't have to worry about it. But you still get your submission log, so you must check that. Um, this, I'm not sure, oh it shows better there. This is what it looks like. So it is a simple form, you cut and paste information into it and it does the work for you. Now moving on how to display the Crossref article IDs. Um, as Ginny said, don't tell people about a DOI until it actually works. Um, and the DOI must be included in what's called the response page, which is the landing page that the DOI would link to. Um, and you should display a Crossref DOI as a hypertext link. So make sure that it's actionable, that it is actually a link. Otherwise, that defeats the whole purpose of adding links into your online content. So this is um, an example of, of a response page. So if I type in a, this DOI, this is the page I'll see. And the page that the DOI takes me to must have some bibliographic information about the item, the title, authors, etc. It should include the DOI um, as a check, and it should have a way to access the full text. And here you've got download P PDF. Um, now this is an, an open journal. Um, so with this journal, it's open access. You don't need a subscription. Now if you have a DOI that's going to subscription content, it must still land on a page that gives you the bibliographic information that gives you the DOI and that also gives you a way to access the full text even if this requires payment or subscription. But it sh a DOI must not take the user to your home page, for example. It must take them to the article to give them some information about the article and that's quite important. Now maintaining your, um, your DOIs Things change, particularly the URL, and also sometimes you made a mistake. The author's name was misspelled or something. So you might want to update your metadata. In this case, you resubmit the metadata and it just overwrites whatever was there on the database because everything is identified by the DOI. So if you submit a new file, with the same DOI as an old file, it will overwrite the old file. And really importantly, as Ginny mentioned, there is a cost of depositing your DOI with Crossref. But if you are redepositing metadata, there's no charge. This is free. And so you are really encouraged to make sure that you do redeposit metadata if anything changes. Um, so as I said, anything with the same DOI will replace the existing record. So it just updates and overwrites it. Um, you can, if it's just the URL, you can send this actually just by email using this very simple syntax. And you'll find information about this on the Crossref help page. So if it is just that your, all your content has moved to a new website, you can simply update the URLs for it. But the Crossref support page gives you a lot of information about this. Um, now, maintaining journal titles. As a publisher, you determine the title and the ISSN combination. And if your journal, chain, the title changes, you will probably have to get a new ISSN. Now, when you register, there are title lists within Crossref. So if there are changes to your ISSN, you have to inform Crossref and there are transfer policies, again, on the help site to, to deal with this that you should refer to. 
And I put this in about transferring content because this is quite often one of the most confusing things for people about what, what do I do about my DOIs if our journal is now published by Taylor and Francis or somebody. The existing Crossref DOIs, of course, still go to your old page. So somebody needs to tell Crossref they need to update the metadata to make sure they go to the new page. Now again, do not change the DOIs, really important. The only thing that is updated is the metadata, the URL and maybe some publisher data underneath it. And it is the new publisher that should take responsibility for this, not the old publisher. So if you sign an agreement for a publisher to take on your journal or your book series, for example, Taylor and Francis, then it is the responsibility of Taylor and Francis to update the metadata, not your responsibility. But remind them. Make sure that they do the work for you. But it is their job, not yours. Um, so transferring, yes, the, the other thing about this is that if you do go to a new publisher, although it is their responsibility, of course, you need to tell Crossref that they're taking over the journal from you. Otherwise, Crossref would think, who are these guys? And why are they depositing someone else's content? And I mentioned about the prefix. The DOI tells you who assigned the DOI, not who currently owns it. So when a publication transfers, the old content will still have the old prefix because the DOI must not change. But the new content that is starting to be published by Taylor and Francis or whoever will have a new prefix assigned by them. Um, I mention this because people, do, people get very concerned about this. And again, referring to the help page, there's a lot there about transferring DOIs and transferring ownership. And again, it is the new publisher who must update this. And there are internationally accepted guidelines for what happens when a journal moves from one publisher to another. And it's called the Project Transfer Code of Practice. This is nothing to do with Crossref. This is an independent organization who have set up good practice guidelines for moving publications. So if your journal moves from one publisher to another, you should consult these. Um, right. Where this starts getting complicated is where you publish your journal and it's on your website and then you start publishing with Elsevier. So Elsevier put all of the archive plus the new content on their website but you still want to keep the old content on your website. So the article appears in two websites. So what happens then about the DOI? Where does it go? Does it go to this website or to that website? And this is covered by Crossref multiple resolution that we'll be talking about later today. So I'm going to leave that with you as a mystery. Now translated journals are another issue. Now remember I said each article must only have one DOI. However, if an article appears in multiple languages, you could argue that each article in each language is a unique article because it's in a separate language. And the normal rule is that if you do have articles in different languages, each language article should have a unique DOI. So if you publish an article in English, it will have one DOI. If you translate the article into Lithuanian and publish it in Lithuanian, that should have a separate DOI because the metadata will be different because it's in a different language and it will probably go to a different page. It may not, but that's the mystery of multiple resolution that I'll talk about later. So normally each language will have its own DOI and again, help pages for this. Um, now, Ginny mentioned conflicts. Conflicts are where a, 
the, two or more DOIs share the same metadata. And this happens when somebody mistakenly reassigns a DOI, or sometimes where a journal is transferring and the old publisher still keeps assigning DOIs and registering them, and the new publisher is also registering and depositing DOIs. So conflicts can happen, and the, the Crossref system will pick up a conflict like that and produce a conflict report. Um, this causes confusions, and also sometimes the DOI will just stop resolving if there are problems on where it should go. Um, so there are conflict reports in the members area. Now, anybody can see this, um, I believe. So you can see some publishers have big problems with this. Um, but you should go in. It should be part of your submission report. Um, and it's also worth occasionally going into the conflict report area in the members site to check that your publications have no conflicts. Um, examining the cross re conflict report, because it's, it's not very easy to understand, again, in the help pages, it tells you how to understand it. Now, finally, the interesting bit for all of you that are not members is linking your references. This is really important. Now, Ginny mentioned in her talk that one of the rules of being a Crossref member is that you should add DOI links into your references. So when you publish an article, the references at the end of that article, or book chapter if you're publishing books, should have DOIs in those references where you can find them. And this is part of this online readership need to read something and link from article to article to article to article. And so you really should put links into your references. And quite a lot of publishers don't really think about that. But you know, if you're a reader, you want to quickly link. You don't want to have to cut and paste the reference into Google or something. So you want to put those links in. Now, how do you add them? Ideally, you want to get the authors to add DOIs into the articles. That would be the ideal situation, because then you don't have to do it. Alternatively, when you copy edit an article or a book chapter, after it has been accepted and it's then edited for style, for consistency, etc., then the copy editor can add DOIs at that stage. Um, there are different ways of doing it, and um, I'll go through some of them. You can, of course, just search for the article on Google or Bing and find a DOI. Um, you could, if you're a very big publisher, set up a query using XML queries, which will return the DOIs for you. Um, my personal favorite is the Crossref lookup tools, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, however, if you are using a third-party tool like Inera X-Styles or Ares Editorial Manager, some of these systems, which are for submission and editing, will have embedded within them a DOI insertion tool. So they will automatically format your references and add that DOI into them, so they can be really useful. Or you can get someone to do it for you, a service provider. So how you can find DOIs, humans or machines, in here, a pussycat or a robot. So the human search either uses the Crossref metadata search or the simple text query, um, or you can use the Crossref uh, REST API, which again, this is the XML lookup, which is an automated system and there's also some help here. But the human searches, I'm going to go through because you can input these in your author instructions and try to get your authors to do this before they even submit the article to you. So the two of them, metadata search and simple text query. Metadata search looks a lot like Google. Uh, basically, it's a very simple search query 
you can cut and paste the reference into it or the authors or the title and it will return to you I haven't got a screenshot here it will return to you any data that Crossref has so the reference that Crossref has with the DOI so you can cut and paste the DOI in so it's the metadata will talk about throughout today because it's a very useful online search tool. Um, so you can search on different things, author names, ORCIDs, the unique author identifier, titles, etc. And it will return to you the full bibliographic reference. And it, it has uh, limitations, so you can select just for publishers or work types. Um, my favorite, and the one I find authors actually find a bit easier, is the simple text query. Now, the simple text query, you can find it um, on the Crossref homepage. Just link there. And I'll just go through quickly how you use it. Um, you, if you need an account, you need to set up an account with this. It's free, but you click on free account there. And it will ask you, it's only, uh, I think it's your name and your email. It's very simple. Once you have registered, you put your email in there, in the registered email box. Oh, sorry, you put registered email box. To register, oh, this is how you register. So it shows it's very simple. Your name, um, your organization. So it's your email and your organization. Uh, you click to agree the terms and you enter the CATCHPA code at the bottom just to prove you're a person. So that's registration. You get a validation. Uh, you validate it. It's just a, a slide here to use the service. Don't click there, which most people do because that takes you to register again. However, assuming you have now registered and you go on to use the simple text query, you put in your registered email and then you simply cut and paste all the references you have. So it can be all the references for an article. Just paste them in. Um, if you want the PubMed ID, you can tick that box. And then you hit the Submit box. And what happens is this. On the same web page, you get all the references again with all the DOIs linked in. So you can cut and paste the whole block of references back into your Word article. So it's a really simple system, and they all come in fully formatted. So it's a really good system. And so if you could encourage your authors to use this, then you can get them to add the DOIs in as well. Now you'll see here, it has not found DOIs for some items. Now some of them, um, the, the one there, Marie McVie, Open Access Articles in the ISR Citation Database, that's probably because that item does not have a DOI. So that's no problem. However, the, um, the next one down there, Yushi Garfield, The Agony and the Ecstasy, The History and Meaning of the Journal Impact Factor. If you read that, that's from a journal, and you would expect that to have a DOI. The fact that it has, does not have a DOI possibly means that there is an error in the reference. So not only does this system give you DOIs, but it can also help you identify where there's a problem in the reference. So with that, you would probably put that through the metadata search or just use Google, because the chances are that there is a problem in that reference um, and that the author has typed it wrongly. So it's a good way of checking references as well as getting DOIs. And I should just say, the, um, this is um, supported. The technology behind this is actually part of the X-Styles in error uh, technology. So it's, if you use X-Styles as a language editing tool, it's the same technology here for looking up DOIs as they provide to you with their own software. The good point is, this is free. Um, if you're a big publisher, you can use an XML query schema. I'm not going to go into this because this is very technical and a little bit boring. Um, but this, this full help pages will tell you about using this. So this is very good if you had, 
hundreds or thousands of references which some of the big, large bibliographic institutions may have. So if you don't get a DOI returned, um, check that the reference is accurate. Not everything has a DOI. Um, and you can create a stored query. So something might get a DOI later, and you could set up an alert within the Crossref system to tell you when a DOI has been assigned, which you could retrospectively add to your references if you wanted to. So, so display guidelines. It, the Crossref DOI must be an actionable link. It must be a hypertext link, as Ginny said. Some people do this. So you just have the word article underlined, and that's a link. Some people put crossref, and that's an actionable link. Um, some people use a crossref logo, and some people put the full URL of the crossref logo. Important point, anybody can use this. You don't need to be a member. It's free. And really, the more people that use DOIs in their references, the better whether they are a member of Crossref or not. Of course, I would like you all to be members of Crossref, but you don't have to be to use this system. And finally, just to say, there are some tools in development for small publishers. One of them will enable you to extract references from the PDF, for example, and to put them through the search query, which may make it easier um, if you don't have the full Word files and better look, look up for the DOIs. So just to summarize on this, why, why are we doing this? It's the broken links. It's using the Crossref DOI to help stop broken links um, within reference citations. And there is a lot of help within the Crossref website. There's some emails for the Crossref support. And also, there are online webinars telling you how to use the system and how to maintain your DOIs. And that's the help as well for that. Thank you.